Good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to come and talk to you about what we're doing in the DSMA. Um, the DSMA is actually a mobile trade association. You may or may not know. We keep gathering people in Barcelona every year, about 100,000 of them. Um, but in addition, we work a lot on regulation and spectrum. But the most exciting thing that we're doing, I think, is um, encouraging collaboration across the mobile operators in order to develop new services and new products that requires interoperability. And I'm going to talk to you about one of these today. So we, we see that there is a number of major market trends that is driving the need for secure digital identity. And I put digital identity at the core of any digital transformation in society, in, in an enterprise, you know, among the government services and so forth. And firstly, we see that digital obviously is everywhere. You know, you go to your banking app and you have everything on your phone these days. Um, we also see that security is not really up to the task. Um, it is, you become too reliable, there's too many things that can go wrong if you lose that phone or if you lose the, uh, or, if some, or if your network is, your services are being hacked. But the third one is what we're entering into now in Europe, which is almost like a perfect storm when it comes to regulatory changes. And it's not just in Europe, but it's, it's across the world as well. So an example I'm sure you all are familiar with is the um, interoperable electronic identities that are now being put in place across the member states within the EU. It means that you can go to any country and you can prove who you you are, primarily for government services, but increasingly public services as well, um, based on your digital identity issued by one government. That is huge. We're doing a very nice uh, pilot at the moment um, between France and the UK, where you can take your French digital identity and open a bank account in the UK. In fact, it's almost easier to open a bank account if you're a French citizen. It's at pilot stage, but it's, it's a very exciting use case. Um, so that's EIDAS. The second one is PSD2, that you're probably aware of as well. Um, this is the Payment Services Directive number two. It creates a separation between the, the banking infrastructure and the access to the accounts and the, and the, and the, um, the, 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 the user information about the accounts and transactions. It means that the banks are looking for ways to keep their relationship to the end users. They're being OTT, as we say. Um, again, it's, it's enormous. It's a huge change for the industry. And it's really um, opening up a new, number of new opportunities as well, but also a number of new challenges when it comes to security. Just another example um, worth mentioning, I think. And the last one that you're probably all familiar with is the GDPR, the General Data and Privacy Regulation in Europe, where you have to have consent for any kind of information that you're using, or you're facing a huge fine. Um, the rules, are, you know, it hasn't gone through the court system yet in terms of testing the boundaries of this, but again, it's enormous. Any personal data that enterprises hold today, have they got consent or not, it's going to be important to understand the value of that data. So, and we see similar changes now happening in terms of in China as well on cybersecurity and the privacy law. There was a new law adopted now in June. Again, it's all about transparency, it's about consent, it's about control for the end users. So digital identity, privacy, trust are increasingly important. And I can stand here talking about that all day, but I will not. I will probably bore you with it. Um, but the point is that it is big trends that are now um, making the, the, the trust, making privacy, making digital identity more important than, than we've ever seen before. So the time is right to have this discussion, I think. So what are the mobile operators doing? And I'm here really just to inform you about what we are doing um, around the world. And, and of course, I'm happy to take any questions and feedback and these kind of things as well, especially afterwards. Um, see what time we have at the end. Basically, the operators, the mobile operators are doing two things when it comes to digital identity. On one hand, they're putting identity at the core of their own services so they can recognize the customers across all everything that they are doing, whether it's their of course, the mobile services, but also the fixed services. Some of, them, some of them are doing financial services like insurance and banking and so forth. They need to have the same view of the customers across all of these services. Nice for in, in the internal view. But the second thing that they're doing, and this is where I'm going to focus most, most of today, is to offer authentication and authorization as a service to any relying parties, to any third parties, through a common set of uh, of AB APIs. And that is a part of the operator's uh, strategies for having what I would call enablement services or ingredient services above and beyond what they're doing for, um, you know, subscription to private and business customers. Um, and even sometimes to have music offers in, in, in partnerships with 
say Spotify as an example, or even their own music services, but they're also at this middle layer, same categories, operator billing. Now we're looking into and we're, we're setting up identity services as well from the operators. Okay. So um, I wanted to introduce Mobile Connect, uh, which is the global identity solution from the operators. Um, so this is not intended to be like a product presentation in any way, but I just wanted to inform you about some of these major trends that is going on uh, now that could be relevant for, for what you've been talking about elsewhere in this conference. Um, it's basically four main capabilities. It's about authenticating a user. It's about authorizing digital transactions payments as well, uh, it's about verifying the identity, and it's about providing attributes about whether the user or the device can be trusted. Has this device been stolen, for example? It's probably useful to know if you're going to run your banking app on that particular uh, mobile device. So we've got some pretty good user feedback on this, in fact, and I will, I will talk about that um, a little bit more. Um, important point is a strong position on privacy um, to ensure both regulatory compliance but also to demonstrate that it is possible to trust the operators with the personal data. Operators are already regulated, they know how to handle personal data in, in general. There are accidents of course, that shouldn't happen, but these things, these things do happen. Um, but, in any, but, in, but they typically know how to handle uh, personal data very well. So Mobile Connect is now available, enabled, about 3 billion users. It means that the operators have stood it up, made it available. We have about 100 million users that used it, um, and 30 million of them are using it every month. And it goes across the 30 markets, 57 operators. I'll show you the coverage later. Um, so this is an example of an industry initiative where the operators are standing up trying to participate in the digital transformation. And with some success, we will, we will see. It's still early days. Um, we only started back in 2014 with the idea and had the first beta launch as well in a particular market. In fact, in, uh, in Sri Lanka was the first market um, that, that stood up Mobile Connect. Um, and since then, it's, it's the, the standardization has, has been maturing and we've, we've rolled it out to a number of other countries as well now. So in the product portfolio ranges um, from authentication, authentication with a PIN, authentication just saying it's okay, just clicking okay. To re typical use cases are to replace passwords. Um, second category is about authorizing a request, adding a context to a particular authentication. Nice for IoT use cases, in fact. If you want, do you want this smart meter to send the data to your electricity company? Yes, no. Enter a PIN if you want to make it more secure. Um, this is my IoT device, I'm claiming ownership, I am giving it permissions. Some nice IoT use cases, of course, in addition to payment. Um, identity is the other category, national ID. So, in, so I'm from Norway, and when I log into my bank account, I enter a PIN on my phone. I don't have a username and password. It's something that's been set up in collaboration between the banks and the operators, whereby the banks have seen my passport when I set my bank account. The operator is storing that on the, on the SIM on the phone. So I type in my date of birth and my mobile number, and they know who I am. There is no username and password. They just the bank will tell on my behalf who I am for any relying parties, whether it's an insurance company or whether it's the government, which is very nice. I like looking for this little, little sign that tells me I don't have to remember another username and password. So that's national ID. Uh, the other one here is phone number. So in, there are cases where it's nice just to log in with your phone number, that the, the relying party, the service party, the app developer, they know, yes, this is your phone, this, is, this belongs to this person, and underneath that, it's a business relationship between the end user and the operator. They know they can trust it. And it's easier for me as an end user to remember, I know my phone number, I cannot remember my 50th username and password because they all changes. I'm lucky if they're choosing my, my email address. So it's a, again, it's a relief for the end users. And the last one is quite exciting as well. It's about confirming information about the user. We have some nice use cases where banks, for instance, need to validate the information that they hold about their, their customers. The operators have already seen information about the users, and they can then compare notes. If the information the operators hold the same as what the banks hold, then it's all good. And I can, I can get back to that, but that is proven to reduce fraud significantly. We're working with some of the credit card companies, and they really demonstrated that this reduced the fraud rates with about five times when they were able to confirm that match, which is costs. This is, this is huge. 
um, account takeover protection, there are indicators on the phone that the operator will know to, that can give uh, an indication of whether this phone is at risk from having been stolen. Example, if call forward has been enabled on the phone permanently, Maybe somebody's trying to take over the account. These things happen all the time. Social engineering. You get a call center of, of the operator's anyone to send out a new SIM card. Um, and then they, um, the fraudsters will then enable call forward on that particular account. So if call forward has been enabled permanently or for a long time or most recently, now maybe you should watch out. If the SIM in that phone is new and there's not a reason why that should be new, I, you know that the phone, that the user got a new, fancy new iPhone X, okay? Maybe you should watch out if the SIM was recently swapped. There are good reasons for it, but there could also be indications of fraud. Um, and of course, if the device is stolen, if it's been reported stolen, and these are the things that the operators know, and they share information about it, maybe you shouldn't trust that phone with your banking app. So these are information that can help um, assure the, the, the reliance on the mobile device for any particular app. And they're held uniquely by, by the operators. And of course, verifying the mobile number as well. The, um, the operators know the mobile number of the device that's initiating a data call. Um, that can be passed along in the call flow towards the relying party securely, and this ca cannot be spoofed. This is the radio connection between the mobile phone and the, um, and the operators. So, um, and then passing this on to the, to, the, to the app developer knows that, yes, this phone number actually belongs to the person or is actually being used by this person now accessing my app. Is this the same as my records? Is there a match? Maybe I can trust it. If it is not that much, I better watch out. So these are just a few examples of how um, operators know things about the device, about the account with the end user that can be used to rely on to add security in, in mobile services. Okay. I think I've gone through, uh, I have gone through this one already, so we're going to skip that. How does it work? So each operator is offering um, their own API gateway with the identity capabilities. Um, so we have about 57 of them at the moment. I, various levels of quality, I should assure, but there's some pretty good ones as well. Um, but that leads to a very fragmented or distributed system of, of, for Shelley, of different identity gateways that all need to respond to the same APIs. So what are we doing? We have a discovery mechanism, the API exchange, that allows this to look like the same uh, uh, the uh, same service. So the user will choose or the service world will initiate a request for authenticating this user. It'll query the API exchange, which then asks the operator for the mobile, asks the end user for the, for the mobile number unless they can get it out from the radio network. The API exchange then reports the, uh, the endpoint and the credentials to the developer who can then perform the authentication directly with the operators. So the, the API exchange is a kind of API routing mechanism, if you like, including the credential management that allows the, the service provider on the fly to detect which or, or to know which operator can, can serve um, that particular user, which operator can authenticate that user or provide information about the device. So that's how we've solved the fragmentation problem that we would inherently have across the operators to avoid each app developer having to connect and to get different credentials for each operator. We have this API exchange that provides that, that, that seamlessly. It's a bit like, you know, you're routing a phone call as well. It works in the same, in a very similar way. So, what does the end user say about this? We have, uh, we have feedback from the end users about the user experience. It's really good, especially when we're using the mobile network to authenticate the users automatically, either just by going into the app or just clicking, I want to log in on the app and they're in. No username and password. Um, we have, in mature markets, there's about 10 to, to 12 transactions a month, and this is primarily focused on very secure transactions. Of course, any kind of digital services would be meant much more um, than that per month. Um, there is, even in some markets, especially when we talk about security assurance services, there's a willingness to pay as well. Um, and we've uh, did some market research, this was again in Norway a few years ago now, where um, the ability to use the mobile to authenticate and to log in to banking services was the third most important reason to choose an operator. It was something that really resonated with the end users. 
And I think it goes for all of us. You know, if I don't have to remember a username and password, it'd be fantastic. And if, as an app developer, if I know that I can really trust this person, maybe I can put in less friction to, to, to give them access to my services. So I mentioned these ones, um, these ones as well, um, a little bit. We're working extensively now with uh, with, with, with banks, with um, internet companies, service providers across the world um, to, uh, to get Mobile Connect deployed in their services. But we have really started with internal services for the operators to start to educate the end users about what this new experience that they can use their mobile phone to access digital services now. Um, and some of the benefits that we've seen is around the user experience, um, but it's also around innovation offering new business opportunities. I mentioned the, uh, with IoT, we have another one about giving permission to your, your children to log into the Lego website, for instance, or to into an educational website. By giving permission, you can expand your market, um, your market as well. Okay, I also wanted to briefly mention the, some government activities we're doing. Um, it's turning out that the government in many, many countries, and I, this goes all the way from the US and Canada and Latin America, here in Europe, there's a number of countries, of course, through IDAS and the EU, but also in Asia, in, in India, in Malaysia, also in China, there is a huge interest for e-government services. And, and, and in order to, to digitally transform government services, they have to understand what is the user that they're dealing with, what is the um, identity of the end user, their citizens that are now trying to access their services. And they look towards the operators and they look towards the banks to be able to provide the, both the security the privacy protecting capabilities, uh, but also the information about the end users. They, they, have, they, they know their identity and they can leverage government issued identity, like a passport or a national identity card, to, um, to present that in a digital transaction <coughs> securely. So we've been working for the last few years in the US with the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, NSTIC, as part of NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Um, where we've set up Mobile Connect for authentication. Um, we've deployed it for um, some healthcare services to get access to medical records. Um, and we are now working on setting up a pilot for polling. Pre next one could be voting, that could be really exciting. But we're starting with something a bit simpler, <laughs> um, just polling. And it's a great way for the, the, local, the local councils, local municipalities, to get feedback from their citizens. What do you think about this particular activity we're doing now, or we would like your views on whatever. Um, nice in terms of citizen engagement. So that's, that's just one example. Um, the IRS was quite interested as well. They have users across the world, and they like to, to and they have fraud when it comes to, to the, um, uh, your t the tax returns. So being, making sure that they knew exactly who they were dealing with and it was a valid uh, submission, again, a good value, very good value. We had another nice one as well in the US um, and also in Spain. It's about age verification for a vending machine. Imagine being able to buy beer out of a vending machine. You can't do it now because they need to prove your age, but the operators know your age. They can confirm, yes, this person is more than 18. Um, you can, you can imagine that you can give your phone away to somebody minor, but you can do it in a shop as well. So, but it was a nice, nice use case. Um, so in EU, we are working now with the European Commission and, and operators and, and, uh, um, and governments in four, three or four different countries now across Europe to uh, facilitate this uh, interoperability of electronic identities so that you can go to one country and you can prove your identity for, for instance, medical services um, in another country. Um, and that is also working, working really well. I'm hoping by the time we get to Barcelona in, in February at MWC, we'll, um, we'll be able to demonstrate that. Um, and there's, there's more things as well going on in, uh, in, the, in the EU. I already mentioned the opening of the bank account. In the UK, uh, the operators are supporting the government, uh, government's identity providers to confirm the information about the users, to log in to, uh, to establish a digital identity, to log in to digital services as well in, here in the UK. Um, in Spain, we've also launched with, the, with some of the local municipalities, again, accessing government services. And in France, there's a very exciting pilot that, if you're lucky, you'll see that it's live. It, it goes live on and off, they're just doing the testing at the moment, to use um, Mobile Connect to authenticate for access to, to, to government services, to checking how many points you have on your, uh, on your um, um, 
driving license. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and what the way that they do it is that you take a you have your national identity card, you take a picture of it, you take a, a selfie, and they combine the two. There's some nice technology that goes behind it. They combine the, the, the identity card and your face, and they do some background checks, and then they establish your identity. Then they know that, yes, we've seen this person, we think this is good enough for the government services. And that's facilitated by Orange and, and, and also by the use of Mobile Connect. It's a nice one. They don't have to go anywhere to get the, to get the, the Know Your Customer uh, um, uh, satisfied. Okay, um, I mentioned, uh, so that's a few examples of how we're working with governments, um, and I'm hopefully that triggered some ideas as well. Um, there's one problem that I mentioned on the technology side in order to make these, you know, 57 operators, or at least a subset of them, look like one entity. You know, you, you go to Facebook, you go to any other API, you know, big, big platform, and you have one contract, you got one price, you got one set of services, and you know who to call if you're lucky. Um, with so many operators, it is quite difficult to get that, uh, to get the same level of seamlessness. And this has been one of the weaknesses um, that I've been really struggling to work with now for the last two years. Um, because it's difficult to get your operators to look like one entity. They are quite different. So on the technology side, I think we got that solved pretty much, what I call the API exchange. Now what we're doing is the same thing on the commercial side as well. So we've so the GSMA is now set up a small veneer of contracting capabilities. It has the intention of simplifying the, the contracting and the billing and the, um, and the support and the service monitoring so that it looks like one service across the operators, but giving plenty of space to anybody else who wants to build on it. This is not about innovation, this is about simplifying the, the, the basics to make to create basically a platform out of the mobile users that can be much more easily accessed than what we've ever seen in the past. Each operator had their individual um, API strategies. So we're starting now with Mobile Connect because it's simple and it needs to be an ingredient um, into anybody's services that covers the whole user base within a particular country. So I just wanted to mention this as well because the innovation is not just happening about the around the technology, about the capabilities, the APIs, the data and so forth. The innovation is also happening happening at the business model side. Um, so this might look simple, but it's all about uh, contract negotiations with the operators. Um, so I just wanted to add a few, assuming I have a little bit more time, I was going to say, tell you a little bit about what the operators are doing and then some of the nice use cases that we deployed in some of the markets and what the effects have been. It's always nice to see whether this has any benefits. So. These are the logos of some of the operators that we're working with. I mentioned the US carriers as well um, earlier. Um, I could add the Canadians as well to this one, which is uh, uh, they're also quite advanced. Um, and of course, I should have all the Indian operators as well uh, here on this, this chart. I kind of ran out of space. I only got the Airtel. Um, so the strategy the operators have to get the mobile connect into market and to take a position within the digital services, what they can offer around identity and attributes, is starting with their own services. So, so the first thing they do is they say, well, you got voice, you got data, you know, you got SMS messaging, and you got mobile connect from us. So it's a standard service that everybody's being enabled for and, and, and included as part of the basic contracts with the operators. The second thing they do is to offer this for their own services. You're looking into self-care, um, whatever value-added services they have, like like video streaming or or music or whatever, they don't have that many, but they have some, and it's all about educating the users and also getting them enabled. In some cases, these authentication capabilities are delivered using a SIM applet, so it's pretty secure, but it needs to be distributed, and that takes a little bit of time. So they start with their own services. The second is that they do is that some have these capabilities in the market for quite some time. We have some, uh, take the Korean operators, for instance, they've been offering age verification. You know, I mentioned the vending machine. They're doing that for games. Um, they've been doing it for years. Um, the same thing are some of the Nordic operators as well. They have secure authentication and identity verification. Um, and what they're doing, uh, what they have done, is to join this global ecosystem now, or to join the other operators for, with their identity services or to be growing the, the, the total base um, of the solution. And of course, then they start to promote it to their own partners. Some of them have a strategy regarding third parties, and they're also getting together to establish joint market offer. And I talked about a commercial federation on the, on, on the previous slide. 
So I mentioned already that we have quite a few operators that has launched. In Europe now it's the, the, um, in France and Spain, the UK and Italy and Switzerland and Finland. Um, the most active markets we have in Asia is probably India. I would highlight that as being quite exciting. The three Chinese operators have launched as well. Um, and, and building on their existing authentication capabilities. Um, the Taiwanese just launched a month ago now, um, all five together, working very closely with the, the city council in Taipei to start offering payment authorization for parking. So nice use case to start with. Um, and Brazil as well is getting very close to, to, to ready as well across all the operators. And, and the, pr primarily the Telefonica and America mobile footprint in LATAM as well is pretty well covered. So it's quite a lot of activities going on around the world. It is still early days, it still requires a lot of improvements, um, but we're getting traction. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, I thought I should just mention a few um, case studies that we have where the service has been deployed and some of the effects. And if there's time, I'm sure that I'm more than happy to take questions at least. So the first one I wanted to highlight, I mentioned that Dialog was one of the first ones to launch Mobile Connect as a beta service back in 2014. And you know, it takes time to improve it, um, but they're doing, they're doing really well. And one thing they did, which was quite exciting, is that they used it for their call centers. So when, um, uh, and, what, and, and because it saves time when they're calling in and they can authenticate using Mobile Connect. But the biggest saving that they found is that um, often the reason customers are calling in is because they lost their password. So being able to reset the password by not calling into the call center, but automatically doing it themselves using Mobile Connect and the phone number really helped them to, to save money on, uh, uh, on, on their call center. And they also got a lot of less, <laughs> lot less frustrated customers. So that's one example. Um, we have SK Telecom. I mentioned they already launched. They have something called T-Authentication. It's been in the market for quite some time. They are, what they recently did now is to use it for um, one of the largest banks in Korea to authenticate access to their mobile app. And it took a lot less time the, um, the user flow to get access on this app was quite cumbersome. You know, lots of forms you need to fill in and so forth. So with this, um, by the use of their Mobile Connect service, they could, uh, it took them a lot shorter because they already get the information, authenticate the information back again from the operator's own, on, on, own data set, and they also got more transactions because it was easier. What I haven't included here, but another one that was quite exciting, is the attrition rate for gaming. So, on one hand, they have an age verification for games that I need to do, that we're now looking to expand into other countries. It's not just Koreans that play Korean games. Um, but I need to verify the age of the game, of the gamer. Um, and that's something that I can do, so that's a new business model, in effect. Otherwise, it becomes quite difficult to confirm, truly confirm their age, that was a regulatory requirement. Um, but the second thing that they had was also the attrition rate of, of signing up for a new game that fell from about 20, 24% down to 4% when they, when they used, for, with social logins, login mechanism, they had 20 plus attrition rate. Um, they used their own um, mobile authentication capabilities. It was down to 4% because it was so much simpler and it was much more reliable. And users were concerned about sharing their gaming preferences on social media as well. You never know where it's going to end up. So there was something about privacy here that, that really appealed to the end users. Okay, an example just in terms of take up, we have now about half of all the logins to Dirks' web portal is happening using Mobile Connect. They found the users find it much, much simpler and that, was, that happened quite quickly in the span of a month or two. Uh, M-Pesa, that is a payment, a mobile financial service in India, um, mobile wallet service basically, where they really increased the number of transactions. Um, uh, because they had to simplify the, the authentication of the users. It was no longer an SMS one-time password, but it was more seamless. And I think the, uh, the last one to, to highlight again is, is Movistar, what they've done in Spain. Uh, uh, and they really re reduced the dropouts on the registration that they had for the self-care portal um, by the use of the, a mobile login mechanism like Mobile Connect. Uh, and they kept growing as well their, their number of, of registered users. 
Okay, so these were just some of the examples I wanted to, to mention. I wanted to, to give you, to inform you about what the mobile industry is doing when it comes to taking a role and being a supportive player in digital transformations, and particularly when it comes to, um, comes to identity. So if there is, I'm looking around for whoever organizes. Are there time for questions? Or are we just moving on? Moving on, okay, great. I will be staying behind afterwards if there's anyone that wants to talk about this further, but anyway. Thank you for listening and hope it's interesting. Thank you.